Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Molly, and I work here at Bipolar UK. If you attended our last webinar um, about bipolar and hypersexual behaviour, you may have seen me. Um, it may have looked slightly sunnier than it does today. Uh, it's very rainy where I am at the moment, so if I suddenly look very dark, um, that's why. So just while everyone is filtering in, hi, Smith. Um, and while the speakers, Samir and Ivan, are coming in, I'm just going to give you all a little bit of information about the way that these webinars work. So the first thing to remember is that they are webinars. So you will only be able to see myself when I'm here, um, Samir and Ivan, but you won't be able to see yourself. So hi, Ivan. Um, if you can't see your face, don't worry. As long as you can see our faces, it's working, you're here um, and everything is A-OK. -okay. Um, the other thing to let you know, if you didn't hear the slightly terrifying voice that announces it very loudly at the beginning, um, today's session is recorded. So if at any point you feel like either you can't stay for the whole session because you have something else going on, um, or the content that's being discussed today is difficult to listen to, just make sure you take care of yourself, take a break, and we will upload this full webinar on our website for viewing later on. Um, so don't feel like you need to you know, absorb all of the content right now. Um, because you will be able to come back to it later. Talking of safety, I'll also be popping some information about further support in the chat. So you're welcome to revisit that at any point. Um, and you can also reach out to me using the chat um, if you'd like to find out more about support outside of this webinar. Just give me a shout. Um, I can see some of you have started to say hi to each other in the chat, which is really nice. So please do continue. Um, the chat feature is also going to be used for questions. So um, Samir and Ivan will be talking, but just so you're aware, at the end, we will have space for questions. Um, and so please do ask any questions you have in the chat and we will be able to come back to them later on. This is a reminder, everyone can see your chat. Um, so if you are going to be posting anything confidential, we just advise that you maybe have a bit of a think about who might be able to see it um, and maybe reserve confidential details wherever possible. So information about you know, your, your full name, for example, or where you live or information about your treatment, the names of doctors, um, anything like that. And please make sure that you're respectful and confidential um, in terms of other people's information as well. Um, so I will kind of disappear off into the ether. I will come back later on to ask some questions. So if everyone can, you know, pop any questions you might have in the chat and I'll come back to it. Um, but I will disappear now and pass on to yourself, Samir and Ivan. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Molly. Okay. Samir, would you like me to kick, kick, kick this off? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Ivan. Sure thing. So, um, <clears throat> hi everyone. As uh, some of you may have attended the International Bipolar Day session, in which Dr. Samir and I briefly spoke. Um, so, my name is Ivan Dankenis. I um, I've um, I've worked in um, learning and development for fifteen years. I've held several career leadership positions and. The angle that I'm coming here from is I've had bipolar since my teens. Uh, I was undiagnosed for over a decade. My condition significantly impacted how I was able to grow my career, amongst other things. And one of these symptoms that unsurprisingly I had was um, paranoia. And to an extent that still occurs now and again. So... When it comes to paranoia, and it looks like we have one of my cats jumping in on the webinar, uh, as a symptom, it can be very overwhelming. And the number one thing to do to try and address it from my perspective is, first of all, ensure that you're in a place of uh, euthymia, so that you're on a stable footing and even keel to start implementing some changes. And for the purpose of this webinar, I don't want to turn it into a lecture. So I'm going to talk about two core concepts, and one of them are uh, some perspective on thoughts and behaviors, uh, things that have really made a difference for me in managing uh, the, the symptoms of paranoia. And then secondly, the concept of tools, what kind of tools have I used to help me achieve and maintain change? 
And I believe that would be a good starting point to uh, start off a conversation and then lead into what uh, Dr. Samir will be sharing with us and the Q&A afterwards. So uh, with regards to reframing your thinking, that's that's what I look at it as. Um, so when, when in the throes of, of paranoia, and you know it's happened to me in, in my career as well. It's it's very hard to have um, to have some objective perspective on what's really going on around you. So one of the key things that I find is important to always try and find a way to regain some control over what you can control. And one of the ways that I found very effective is uh, breaking all my behaviors and thinking patterns down into little pieces and try and really understand them better and then reframe the thinking. So, I mean, to set the stage here, <clears throat> a lot of these um, negative thoughts, um, you know, they can be quite disruptive. And I'll give you a cliche example. You know, I've gone through periods of time where it seemed as if um, I was acting irrational. I could feel myself uh, being quite agitated and I may, I may have been coupled with certain thoughts about what was going on in the workplace towards me. That was my thought. And then I would get incredibly anxious and go into a spiral as to thinking, gosh, what are other people thinking of me? How is this going to affect me? Oh my God, next things will never be the same. I'm going to lose my job, et, et cetera, et cetera. And there's two, um, there's two sides to that coin. I just take that example. So on the one hand, you, know, you may be on certain occasions be acting quite odd to people and people may, wondering, may be wondering what's going on with you. Uh, and it may leave an effect, uh, but that's A, not always negative. People may be generally concerned about you. On the flip side of that, what I've just described is that this really may all be in your head. And I know for a fact that on occasion, it's been in my head. I want to take a step back from all this confusion that I've just described to determine what can, we, what can be done to regain some control in a situation like that and a few of the things that have helped for me. So one of the most valuable and difficult things that I've learned is the need and the ability to unlearn some of the thinking and behavioral patterns that have become, that have become part of who I am. And that sounds a bit of like a grandiose statement to an extent, but let's try and keep that simple. But in the context of self-management, what I mean is, you know, I came to the conclusion, okay, me not showing up for work for a week and not answering the phone because I'm, I'm having a paranoia attack about something that happened at work in my head, that's just not sustainable, right? So, okay, let's let's break that down. And that is something that's easier said than done. You can't really do that on your own. And that is where I'll touch upon some of the resources you can use when I talk about tools. Um, now, one of the things that does help and you can do on your own is use something like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, there are some self-help tools around that. Um, but again, we'll circle back to that in a moment. You know, one of the things I mentioned during the, the shorter webinar version of this um, by Paul UK Day was self-forgiveness. That is just so critical if you have a setback based on you setting yourself some goals about what you want to achieve at work or any of your or any of your goals in personal life and you feel you feel you believe you've messed up it doesn't matter if it's true or not just give yourself permission 
to forgive yourself. Be kind. It's okay. Take that effort before you spiral into more paranoid behavior. And that's easier said than done. And it only works through practice. And that then fits in with the second thing I mentioned during the short webinar, which was to take baby steps. And part of my condition and how it expresses itself is that I always want to achieve grandiose goals. Uh, it has to be all or nothing. And part of the paranoia uh, at times was that people were trying to prevent me from doing so. But in reality, the problem was often that I was trying to bat off more than I could chew in one go. And you need to learn to set yourself some baby step goals, like break things down into little steps. Like if you're trying to climb a mountain, it's so much harder than, you know, going up a ladder or just taking a few steps. Uh, those are cliches, but the practical ways that you can do that is by some of the aspects, some of the things that I've done that I'm now going to discuss as part of the tools. And one of them, the key one has been therapy. Now, therapy by itself is, is the act of, yeah, go and, go and find a therapist that you can bond with and trust, and that can be a really tough call. Uh, it took me a long time to achieve that. And um, I've heard stories from people who um, had very bad experiences, but the reality is just do the research, speak to a doctor, see if you can get some guidance on uh, a, a central database where you can look up some private therapists if, if you can afford that, or see if you can get a referral through the NHS. The point is, do not give up, keep persisting on that, and have some backup uh, in your personal in your personal life some people that you can rely on to keep encouraging you now once you find someone that you can bond with and work uh, through what's going on in your head one of the first things that i did uh, with my therapist was unpick my traumas and that again takes time but it helped me to truly distinguish what is real and what isn't and it will help you also determine you know are you actually in a situation that is toxic or hurtful for you or are you a, acting on paranoid thoughts that are entirely imaginary and once you do that you can start honing into those in that relationship of trust and you know trying to find some alternative ways of dealing with those things in life um that aside therapy isn't the fix all there is no fix all when it comes to uh living with bipolar something that i also work with is medication i have found that the best way for me to thrive in life uh, successfully has been this constant self-evaluation and questioning and curiosity, wanting to understand, okay, why am I acting like this? Why am I thinking like this? And it's, it makes for actually a very fulfilling life that way. And the more you are, or rather, the less you are drawn into this miasma of negative thoughts and paranoid thoughts and the energy that you're expending trying to go through life um, without it affecting you too much, the mental energy that you're getting back, you can use that very effectively in a lot more interesting things for life. And one of the last thing, the last thing I mentioned is uh, a tool that I've found incredibly useful in, in my career, which has no direct therapeutic bearing, but has been instrumental in me getting a much better perspective on how I interact with people, uh, especially when I may be going through certain uh, bipolar episodes. And that um, there are tools out there. And I think after the webinar, we might be able to share some of them. 
They will give you some insights into people's uh, behavioral and thinking styles. They're like psychometric tools. Some of you on the call may be familiar with them. They're like MBTI uh, and, and several other ones. And going through that of doing some of these assessments and maybe having a coach walk you through what it all means, what kind of people, what kind of person you are, forget about your bipolar, but as an individual, as a personality, and then look at the other types of personalities out there will really help you um, live better with other people. And it will really help dispel some of these paranoid thoughts. Now, those are some of the concepts that I wanted to touch upon. Uh, again, I did want this to turn into a lecture. I hope it's thought provoking that he raises some questions uh, that we can build on in the Q&A. And now I'd like to hand over to um, Dr. Samir. Uh, super, Ivan. Thank you very much. Can I just check my slides are up there and they're okay? Yes, indeed. Super. Well, Ivan, I'm not going to say anything more erudite than yourself there, because I think being able to convey your own story makes a lot more sense to people than a, than a doctor going on about his stuff. But I'm going to go through my stuff anyway. And I think the most important thing, or for me, the most interesting thing will be the Q&A afterwards. So my name is Samir Johar. I'm a senior clinical lecturer, so I'm a consultant psychiatrist, medically qualified doctor, and I work at the Institute of Psychiatry, and I look after the care of young people with psychosis, and we see a lot of young people with bipolar disorder. And I guess the focus of my research in the last few years has been in uh, people with psychosis and bipolar disorder. And it's very nice to be invited to come and sort of share the work that I've done and my musings. I always think when you have a speaker, you need to know a little bit about them. So I'm from Glasgow and I came down to London about just over 10 years ago to do research, looking really at the neurochemistry of psychosis in people through brain imaging. Um, and I worked as a consultant for over 10 years. These are my declarations of interest. Uh, I've done non-promotional educational talks and antipsychotics really. So what is it I'm going to cover? I think it's important to cover what is psychosis, uh, which all of you will know, but I think it's nice to have a, a way of understanding it and a definition. Then I'm going to go through a case history just taken from hundreds of people I've seen just to illustrate what, what psychosis is like for some people with bipolar and also how the treatments will evolve and help people and what we can offer to people. Um, from a neuroscience perspective, I've got an interesting slide. Well, I think it's interesting anyway, where we talk about, well, what's the neuroscience behind someone having delusions? What's, what's our current way of thinking, making sense of that? Because there's a neuroscientific basis for most of the stuff that we do and models. And then more practically, the treatments that are available to people, and then the take home message. So hopefully that won't be too boring. And as ever, I'll keep our chair happy and keep to time. So firstly, well, what is psychosis? And I think it's important to say it's a symptom. It's not a cause. I always use the analogy of cough. You know, all that coughs is not COVID. You can have a number of different causes for symptoms. And it's the same with psychosis. You can have psychotic symptoms due to organic things. So by organic, you can have something happen with your thyroid, a major infection, or you can have psychiatric disorders, depression, bipolar disorder, construct of schizophrenia, or delusional disorder. So there's a whole host of different things people can have. But psychosis, I would say, is a set of symptoms. And I think that's quite important. I still teach that to our medical students and even some of our psychiatrists. So what do I include when I talk about psychotic symptoms? I guess it's a change in someone's behavior, their emotions, and their thinking. And at a common level, what are the common psychotic symptoms? Well, I guess they're delusions and hallucinations. So let's define what those are. So what's a delusion? Well, I guess a delusion 
is, well, it's been defined for hundreds of years, but a working definition. None of these things are set in stone. So when someone has a false, unshakable belief uh, with of keeping with cultural norms, and I think it's quite important to have that in one's mind because you can have things going on, but your interpretation of it might be delusional. And we'll come on to that when we go through the case history. So for example, you think people might have delusions of jealousy. They might believe their partner's cheating on them and they hold that to an exceptional degree. And you ask them why they believe that and they'll say, well, it's something in their eyes or something like that. But the important thing is it's out of the context of what they experience. So their partner might well be cheating on them, but their inference they draw is delusional. And that's our definition of delusions. Hallucinations is easier to define, isn't it? Because you can look at any one of our perceptions, be it visual, auditory, gustatory, olfactory, and it's experiencing those without a stimulus. So hearing things that other people can't hear, seeing things that other people can't see, smelling or tasting things, out with of keeping with the stimulus. Other psychotic symptoms can be your thinking being a bit muddled up and a whole host of, of other psychotic symptoms which we'll come on to. The main ones I think people recognize, especially in bipolar, would be delusions. And paranoia can be a bit of that, or hallucinations. So I think it's important to know, well, how common are they in people with bipolar? And it's something I've always come across when I've done my teaching or looking after the care of people, or even you know speaking, speaking to colleagues, really. A lot of people will not understand that a significant proportion of people with bipolar have psychotic symptoms. They'll come and go. And this was illustrated in a, a nice study from the Netherlands where people were interviewed in depth, and people with bipolar one, so people who've had mania at some point in their lives, and about three quarters of people will have had psychotic symptoms at some point in their life. So they are common. And I think it's a it's touching on Yvonne's point there as well. A lot of people wouldn't talk about them. I think that's an important thing. That's one of the reasons for these webinars, I think. Um, and if we look at the general population, well, how many people might experience psychotic symptoms in the general population? If you look at the literature, it's about 5%, 5 to 7% of people. So there's a significant, significant elevation there in people with bipolar one having them. Um, I'm touching on fact, but I like to intersperse it with opinion, if you, if you don't mind. In my opinion is it's not something to be scared of and something we should be talking about. And I think the main message is that it's imminently treatable. I think that's something to take home from there. So in essence, we've defined what psychotic symptoms are. They're not a cause, they're a set of symptoms. The main ones that we look at would be delusions or hallucinations, the reasonable definitions of those. And it's commonly seen. People with bipolar one and bipolar two as well, probably not to the same degree. So let's go through a case history to just illustrate this. And it's, it's taken from a number of ones, so it's not one person's case. There's no confidentiality issues. So it's a young man I saw in his early 20s, and he described hearing voices talking about him. He didn't recognize them, telling him bad things, telling him to do bad things to himself, to harm himself. And the important thing with them is that they were completely new. They weren't things that he'd experienced before. It was a new phenomena. And it was distressing for him. Now, in that context, he didn't just have them. He was scared. He was scared to leave the house. He described paranoia. And he described really thinking that there were cameras in the house, people spying on him. He thought his work colleagues were conspiring against him in his job. They were talking about him. And it was a big plot all out to get him. He felt that his social media had been hacked. and that People were doing things to him. The onset of this had been fairly quick. It had come in the context of his mood symptoms. And it had come on in the last few weeks or so. What's important, I think, to know, oh, I'll just go back here. He denied any anxiety symptoms, but he noticed that his mood 
had also been affected as well in the context of that. So it had these psychotic symptoms, but it also had changes in his mood. I think the way that we would make sense of mood symptoms of people is we split it into thinking symptoms, cognitive symptoms, biological symptoms. So his concentration had gone, he was not enjoying things in anhedonia, he was irritable, felt it was difficult to sit still, he had a need to pace, he was agitated, he wasn't sleeping very well, he was having difficulty waking up in the middle of the night, he had weight loss, he felt low in his mood, there was suicidality there, um, and there had been a shift in his thinking, very, very negative, uh, no anxiety symptoms there. So he developed paranoia, auditory hallucinations, and mood symptoms. And for me, the big thing with all of these things when we look after folk or we try and help them get on with their lives, it had been a functional decline. He hadn't left the house. He wasn't seeing friends. He just wasn't functioning. Important things from his history is that he'd functioned well before. He'd never had any of this of major psychiatric stuff really bothering him too much. At 16, he'd had a classic depression uh, with the biological symptoms and the thinking symptoms as before. What I've pointed out here is that the depression's a bit different. You get a little bit of slowing up, but you also get times where you can't quite filter information. So you get perceptual problems in terms of hearing sounds or whispers. And he'd had that with his depression, but it hadn't been picked up before. And then he had a little bit of high mood and he'd had almost delusional beliefs, believing that he had special powers, as well as talking very quickly. The important point here was that he hadn't accessed help at that point or got proper treatment, but it was all there in his past before this major episode. And I think that was the main thing. One year after that episode, he had a similar one. He almost traveled to the US to meet a film star because he thought he had some connection to them. The psychotic symptoms were still there, very much the same themes. And that makes sense because there was things that he was experiencing anyway in his life. And there were things that he couldn't quite make sense of. So in terms of his care, and that's the most important thing, we saw him within an early intervention service. So community services run for people present for the first time with psychosis. About 20% of the people we might see will have bipolar disorder. And when we saw him and went through his history, it was pretty clear that he had psychosis, that it affected his functioning, and he needed help to get him back on track. We offered a variety of treatments. First treatment we offered was a medicine. Let him know about the side effects of the medicine in terms of which ones he would prefer as opposed to others. Because the efficacy or ability to, to make a difference is very much the same. He chose our piprazole, and I can talk about that in a bit. He tolerated it well, and his symptoms went down within about two to three weeks. And the way that we communicated it to him was that, yes, these things can be going on, and we're not going to argue about whether they're real or not, but they're causing you distress. And I think that was the main issue in getting him on board. And the medicines help you tolerate the distress and deal with the distress. And so, therefore, you're working towards the same goal. And that's, that's the way that we would work through things with him. And what he described is the volume of the voices going down and starting to make sense of things. Less distressed by those experiences. Functioning better. Getting out of the house. Thinking clearer. He was seeing one of our, our care coordinators who was great going out to the house, seeing him, just making sure he was getting on with his life, watching out for his thinking, the suicidality. And he's a young boy, so helping his mum and dad just make sense of things and involving them. And I think, you know, letting them know what they could do that's helpful. Um, and they weren't doing anything that was unhelpful, but really supporting them. And then along the way, once things had improved and settled, it was helping with his occupational functioning getting it back to work, phase return, and back in there, and then thinking about the future and how we prevent these events. And we'll come on to that in a bit. So that was the case history, but essentially it was someone presenting with a clear history of bipolar disorder. When they'd had their mood episodes, they'd had psychotic symptoms, it just weren't very obvious or overt before, but when they did present, they were very, very clear, eminently treatable, 
therapeutic relationship with them, getting them back functioning, and then focusing on preventing it happening again, involving family, those close to him. And I think that was the main focus in the way that we did things for him. So that was quite a nice story, I think. So a model for understanding delusions. Now, some might think there isn't a lot of neuroscience to what we do in psychiatry, and I'd agree to some extent, but there is, there is evidence out there for things, and it's how we make sense of that evidence and how we apply models to behavior. Because I guess it's, you know, we're talking about people's minds, we're not talking just about brains here. And it's integrating our environment, psychological functioning, also into basic fundamental neuroscience. So the most parsimonious model, I think, for looking at how people might have delusions, is probably the salience model and the dopamine system. You'll all have come across dopamine, the neuromodulator, in different forms. So dopamine for pleasure in some areas of the brain, dopamine for movement in the basal ganglia. For example, Parkinson's disease, where you have less dopamine neurons and less production, you've got sparsity of movement. But also in psychosis, we do see in some people a finding where your dopamine system does appear to be perturbed and not working optimally. So producing more dopamine than it should be in the striatum of the brain, so the back of the brain, the basal ganglia, in people with psychosis. So that's a finding we have from brain imaging. It's a finding we have based on behavioral pharmacology as well. And a model for understanding how that system could affect delusions is looking at salience. So if you think about what salience is, we can hear stuff, we can perceive stuff, we can perceive any input and make sense of it. That's how our brains work. You receive an input, you process it, and you then make sense of it. And what can happen in people is if your dopamine system is a bit out of whack and not fine tuning, some of the inputs just might not be filtered very well. So you'd consider it a software problem. And therefore, you might give meaning to something you wouldn't ordinarily give meaning to. And so you can obviously have a problem with a work colleague. And you might think, you know, they're talking about me in the office. But the inference you draw is so much more than the input you're getting. And the model is thinking, well, if your dopamine system's a little bit out of whack, it might just affect your processing of information and the filtering of information. And that feeds quite nicely clinically because we know that some of the dopamine medicines will affect delusions, the distress caused by delusions, and help with them. And we can talk about the side effects because there are side effects with every medicine. But that's the model. Um, and it's quite a nice model. And it makes it does make one think. We did a study, um, if I can get my slides working, good academic there, eh? where we looked at the dopamine system in people with bipolar and mania. And what did we find? Well, people with bipolar who had psychosis tended to have the same problems of the dopamine system you would see in people with schizophrenia. And there have been lots and lots of studies in schizophrenia, precious few in people with bipolar. But the take home message for me was that psychotic symptoms appear to occur when your dopamine system is out of whack and they're not linked to whether you have bipolar or another disorder. And the symptoms respond to treatment, so that makes sense. We offer people a treatment affecting the dopamine system, it does tend to help with these types of psychotic symptoms, the delusions and hallucinations. So that brings me on to treatment, I guess. And I guess that's the main issue when we're thinking as, as healthcare professionals, how do we help people and what models do we use or how do we make sense of things and communicate it? The rubric I think we've had, and I think we'll always continue to have in psychiatry, hopefully, is biological, psychological, and social. Because they're all interlinked, aren't they? You know, what happens out there affects in here and vice versa. And as I said, we're looking after people from brains. So you think, okay, what biological measures would be helpful for someone who's having psychosis in the context of bipolar? 
and you'll all come across this, so I'm not going to insult your intelligence by making a big deal of it. Usually medicines affect the dopamine system. Our vernacular for pharmacology is a bit 1960s. We see antipsychotics, but a lot of them have different effects. Generally, medicines that bring down or block the dopamine system to a degree help people. We tend to offer young people partial agonists. What does that mean? It means that you probably don't get the same uh, degree of blocking of a receptor, which means people tend to find the medicines less blunting and they take them or less affecting of other things. Uh, but it's individual. My own perspective as a doctor is that you let people know the side effect profiles, you let them choose which medicine they would wish. Most young people pick one of the partial agonists because there's no weight gain associated with it. And you do get side effects with some of them. But I think the important thing, if you start at the low dose, you let the person make a decision and you take things from there. That's the predominant biological treatment, really, for psychosis. And the psychological treatments, well, I think it's so individual, isn't it? You have all the different schools of psychotherapy, but it's the one ingredient, is, as Ivan pointed out there, it's looking as to the individual person, their needs, listening, and just a degree of continuity. Psychoeducation, I think, is very helpful. We find that helpful. Young people present for the first time, and they pick up on it, they run with it. You know, understanding the role of sleep, what our triggers are, what are the aspects of things that can cause relapse. And those are the main things um, in terms of evidence-based psychological therapies. And then the social. And uh, none of these are mutually exclusive, but it's someone's environment. So even if you go back, think about the delusions, the model I gave for the system. So if you have a cyst dopamine system, it's a little bit out of whack and you're in your environment. If you go back to that environment without doing something to your dopamine system, it's going to get worse. And it's letting people know that, but it's also making sure their environment is less, is more stress-free, really. There's less stressors in their environment. People around them are aware of things. They're able to talk openly about how things are affecting them without being worried about people going off the deep end or anything else. Supporting family as well. I think the care we provide, well, it's not good enough, really. But we can provide monitoring. We can provide listening. And really making sure that we're covering all the bases with people. Um, I think that's one thing we can offer in the UK is, is community care. Um, because a lot of people will either choose to take medicine or not, but it's, it's, I think, being aware of things. But I'd also say the important thing in the social is that things fluctuate for folk. And just because I see someone for 10 minutes and they're not paranoid doesn't mean it isn't there. And I think it's listening to family who I've said they probably know, well, usually know more than us about what's happening in someone's home. And then I think the most important thing, the most important aspect for me is as a clinician, is relapse prevention. It's letting someone make sense of what they've experienced. Um, them, you know, them being able to say, well, this did cause me distress. It's not the part of the normal me. That's what people will usually say. And then thinking of strategies that they can manage in the future to prevent it coming back. That'll involve all of those three things. Biological treatments for relapse prevention have a significantly good evidence base psychological treatments in terms of being able to deal with life stressors and make sense of things it has to be important. And then your social environment. Um, uh, I haven't added it there, but small things also like substance misuse, which again have little triggers. And so if you've got a reasonable relapse prevention strategy, the person signs up to it themselves, and that's the way it should be, involving biological, psychological, and social factors. I think that's the reasonable way of taking things forward in regard to people with bipolar disorder. So what's my take home message from this as a, as a clinician and a vague academic? I think it's knowing that psychotic symptoms are common. We can talk about them. Um, they might not wish to speak about them, but we know they're there and family know they're there. And I think that's important and to ask about them when people present. 
with mood symptoms because they, they do affect your function. We've got effective treatments for people and people should be able to make their own decisions. If, if a young person can pick their phone, uh, they can jolly well pick their other treatments. And there's other issues there in regard to advanced treatment directives for the future. So hopefully I've been able to cover a little bit about what cyclosis is, its relevance to bipolar disorder, case history, some neuroscience in regard to how we make sense of delusions. There's a work in progress. And then hopefully a positive message that it's something that we have to wrestle with, but we should be able to prevent it happening again for folk and let them facilitate and manage their own care. So I'll hopefully get to time. And more importantly, I think we've got time to have a good chat and see if anyone agrees or disagrees with anything we say. So thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. I thought that was incredibly interesting. I know um, lots and lots of our community really, really want to talk about um, this symptom and, you know, the symptoms that that people who are affected by bipolar experience so it was really so interesting to hear both of you talk um, and we got so many questions so I want to thank everyone for popping your questions in the chat um, just as a reminder before I start feeding these questions through if there's anything that we don't answer today um, you're welcome to reach out to us directly and we'd be happy to have a conversation about them our email address is info at bipolaruk.org there were also a lot of people sharing their experiences of being in hospital or struggling to access care. And again, we'd be happy to talk about them within our services. And you can also join our e-community, um, which will enable you to connect with lots and lots of people all at once and to really have a safe space to share those experiences. Um, but as I said, we've had many, many questions, so we'll try and answer as many as possible today. Um, and Either or, you can both feed in, because I'm sure you'll both have um, similar opinions, but also some differences depending on your experience. So the first question we got is, how do you recognize when you're experiencing a paranoid thought, um, particularly when it feels very real for you? So I don't know if either of you have experience of that. Even I could see some nodding. <laughs> Please, Ivan. Um... I don't know. I'd, I'd like, I'd like somewhere to give some perspective first, maybe. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this: I, I paranoid thoughts don't seem paranoid when you're first experiencing them. I I've only come to recognize them through real intensive dedication to self management and and watching out for you know, changes in my own thinking and behavior and feelings. Samuel, do you have anything to add to that, maybe? Um, no, really, I think, by its very definition, if you're developing a delusion, you're not going to probably understand what's, yeah. not what's going on, but just the amount of distress it's causing you. And as a clinician, I guess we're usually asked by other people, not the person themselves, when you got those sort of beliefs. Um, and I think the skill or the hopeful skill is being able to just communicate that you that some, someone's distressed by it as opposed to anything else and that you want to help with that side of things. And then, as you say, once someone's better, they can look back, reflect, and they'll make sense of that themselves. Early warning signs. Sometimes we see them in folks, and that's another part of the relapse prevention, isn't it? That you'll have some early warning signs you'll be aware of. But it's it's, it's a difficult process. Uh, I don't know if that's a good enough answer to the question. I think it's a realistic answer. Uh, <laughs> if, yeah, if I reflect back to the times when I first started to have certain thoughts that you could class as, you know, whether it be, uh, paranoid or psychotic you know you don't know you don't know it's it it transitions it, it just it happens it's it's natural it, it feels what it is it feels as real it's only afterwards once you gain additional perspectives and, and knowledge and, and all sorts of the other things that we touched upon and that happens through intervention uh, remission of some kind then you can start reflecting and thinking back like, oh yeah, okay. I can see I can see what was going on there. 
Although I'd be interested to hear if, you know, people who are carers or relatives of people with bipolar have a different perspective on that. But I, I'm, I'm conscious that we're not asking questions of the audience. Mm. Yeah, no, but we'd be happy for, for everyone to kind of share their experience, obviously in the chat, but also, as I said, within our services, because I think it's such a good starting place for lots of these conversations. So thank you very much, both of you. Um, the next question kind of related, and the one after this will be <laughs> too, um, is, have you found or are there any kind of ways that you can question, challenge or manage your paranoid thoughts? A lot of people in the chat talked about how scary they are when they're happening um, and how overwhelming they can feel. So if you recognize you've, you've kind of completed step one, you recognize that's what's happening. Have either of you found any techniques that are helpful for managing those feelings um, or for questioning or challenging them? Ivan, do you want to go first or do you want me to go? Want to go first? Yeah, of course. Um, clinically, it's difficult, I think, but it's like any any symptom or anything we have. You've got something majorly on your mind, knowing it's going to ebb and flow and fluctuate, and being able to sit with someone else and just have them take the edge off things for you. I think is helpful. And people have told me it's helpful. I've seen it being helpful. Um, it's really your environment. It's, just, it's people around you being able to talk about it without being scared that someone's going to do anything, you know, in regard to that, or they're going to call the police or anything else like that. It's being human with someone, isn't it? Of course, the medicines help, um, but you know, nothing's in isolation. So my ideal method or way of looking after someone when this happens is they have access to medicines. That help with the distress. They're in an environment that's supportive. The family know what they can do. But they also know that they can we can tell people about these things and they can talk about them without people wanting to talk over them or argue whether it's real or not, because that's not particularly helpful. But it's it's knowing that the treatments are there. And I think it's it's probably a bit of both of those things. But it look, I haven't had it and uh, I can only empathize with the people I look after. Uh, I mainly, I can only back up what Samir has just said, because if I, re if I look back at the last, what is it, 20 years, shall we say, 25 years maybe, I have more examples of what not to do than what to do. It, and, and by that, I'll say the one thing is, what hell or high water find a way not to be alone with this? No matter how, it doesn't matter what your other feelings are, whether it is embarrassment or some sort of perceived sense of humiliation. I know I used to feel like that. I, I'm not saying it is, but that was one of the feelings I used to have once upon a time. It, work through it, suck it up. It, it, whatever you need to do, keep your head down. You're aware this is happening to you find ways to compartmentalize, but keep your eyes on the prize. And in, in this case, that is speak to someone that can help you weather through this and get whatever care it is you need. Because remaining on your own with those kind of thoughts is not going anywhere well. Thank you, both of you. And I think the kind of final part, the, another question we had um, is given how distressing and how overwhelming and how difficult some of some paranoid thoughts can be for some people, once you start to feel a little bit better, how do you start to look after yourself um, and manage some of the experiences that might have come from an episode of paranoia or, as you mentioned, some more psychosis linked to paranoia? I'll, um, I'll take that one first, if you don't mind, Samir. Um, so again, speaking from personal experience, I'll say, well, do a little assessment of, you know, so what's the damage been? And by that, I mean, have you managed to you know, unintentionally hurt someone? I like hurt their feelings. Have you been, you know, horrible to someone close to you? Uh, because that was just part of your behavior. Have you got yourself into some kind of financial trouble? Take stock, like have any of these things happened? And then if that is the case, you know, try and find some help to work through that. Secondly, speak to some people, preferably a healthcare professional, 
and and try or either that or do some research for self management techniques. So that was my number one go to point. Once I knew and I accepted where I stood and what I was living with, my immediate reaction was, okay, I need to know. I need to understand how does this work. It, that that is my personality. I need to know. So I researched the bejesus out of that, and there are so many self uh, management techniques and then really reflection reflect 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 learn to understand yourself like yeah turn yourself inwards but in a good way as in look at what what are these behavior and thought patterns like like what what are the good ones from your perspective like yeah this this is me at my i use the term cautiously normal and these are the behaviors that are going to cause me anguish and hurt or thoughts and learn to recognize them and then practice whatever it is that may help you avoid triggers because triggers are related to that as well. And once you start learning those, and that again is you're not gonna have it like that, it'll take a bit of time. Then eventually you build up this little arsenal of coping mechanisms and self-help mechanisms that you can use, and they're individual to each person, although you know. Uh, Bipolar UK and the website actually have a very good breakdown of some of these. But yeah, it's going to be down to self-help and understanding. Samuel? Nothing to add. Sometimes when you don't have anything more useful to say, you just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was really, really useful to know. I know I've spoken to both of you before. I have a family member who struggled with paranoia, and I think knowing how to care for yourself is so, so important. So thank you very much. Um, the next, we had quite a lot of questions, actually, about therapies, about therapeutic interventions, about how useful or helpful they are, what might work best, etc. cetera. Um, just to reinforce, again, a lot of the conversations that were happening about therapy were about access to therapy, and we'd really invite you to come back to the charity, we'd be happy to talk about it, recommend routes, discuss our experiences, all that kind of thing. So pop us across an email at info at bipoduk.org. But one of the big questions was, what kind of therapy have you found helpful or might be helpful for someone who's managing paranoia? And is there a right time to access therapy? So one of the questions was, is therapy helpful when you're actively experiencing paranoia or is it easier or more beneficial to access? Once you're feeling a little bit better. So a bit of a two-part in there. Can I start, Ivan? I think it's so individual, isn't it? Because for some people, you know, medicine plus therapy at the acute stage is helpful. And then some people, it just focuses their mind so much on it. You see that it causes more distress. And that's where I think people with bipolar need to be able to access good therapists. Because a good therapist will pick up on whether what they're doing is helpful or not. And my take on these things is it's very clear. If something's going to cause an effect, it will also cause a side effect. And so some therapies in the acute stage might not be so helpful for folk. And that's why I think it's important to have multidisciplinary care. You know, not just from one doctor in isolation, one psychologist in isolation, multidisciplinary team, usually with a care coordinator, just to be able to know if something is helping someone. In terms of evidence base, people would agree that you know um, medicine plus psychological therapy is generally more helpful. But uh, I would just always caution. It's the same with medicines and side effects. If someone takes a medicine and gets a side effect, well, I wouldn't want to continue taking that medicine. Um, I'd want a choice of things. So I think it is individual. It can be beneficial, but it's within the setting of, of more holistic care. Now, once someone's got over the acute episode, if they want a period of reflection and they think, you know, to just try and make sense of things, I think that's a different kettle of fish. And you generally say that's a helpful thing, isn't it? So to summarize, I think in acute care, you have to be careful with medicines and with therapy. You need experienced people managing that side of things. And then relapse preventions, it is necessary, I think, to go through things, reflect triggers, and just making sure that things don't crop up again. I've um, I actually think there's a lot to unpack in those questions. So let me 
take a stab at it from my perspective. Um, so what one of the bits that I heard in this question was, is therapy useful slash suitable during or after? Uh, from personal perspective, I'll say this. When you're experiencing paranoia or psychosis or, well, frankly, any of the more pronounced uh, symptoms of bipolar, you're going to experience any type of therapy or intervention differently than you would if you were euthymic, euthymic, like on an even keel. That, like, that, is, that is unavoidable. So you won't be open. Well, my, my, again, I'm speaking purely my experience, right? Which is my belief is you won't be able to, you won't be open to hearing some of the uh, insights you might be able to gather. However, is is it is it useful to have therapy while you're under while you're experiencing these extreme symptoms? Yes, because there, it's a different type of management and, and help that you're uh, receiving. As for the question, what type of therapy is useful? Um, I'll tell you this. For me, what's made a difference is not being what kind of therapy. It is who the therapist was what kind of person they were forget about all the the fancy is it cognitive behavior therapy is it this that or the other is it a a qualified therapist and i i will i advise you to steer away from life coaches and so forth when it comes to seeking help relating to anything to do with mental health and bipolar but is it a qualified therapist that's number one qualification and number two you just got to figure out, are they a personality you gel with? Because that is the key thing. You need to build a trust experience. And the type of techniques or methodology they may use, never mind. Believe you me, it is secondary. That I can guarantee you. Uh, the last part of this question is I'll unpick. Is there a right time? No. Well, I will, uh, you know what? No, I'm actually going to say if... If you're ever in a position where you're at the risk of losing your job, uh, your partner might be leaving you. You know, I'm, I'm I'm creating a unique, you know, I'm creating a bit of a dramatic situation here. Good lord! <laughs> and if you have people saying, "Listen, you know, you're going to lose a really good thing that you have in life here by just keep going on this crash course of self destruction, go and have therapy," those are clues. It means go and do it, no matter how wrong it might feel or whatever. It, that's what I had to do. You know, I didn't wake up one day and suddenly felt completely at ease with the concept to go and find a perfect stranger to confine my most innermost traumas with. No. Um, but I decided to suck it up and, and have a stab at it. And I was fortunate enough to eventually find the right person. And I was with, you know, I... that relationship therapeutic relationship transformed but it took six years so have my, have clear <laughs> expectations everyone including myself also goes into it like all right this is my agenda i want to achieve these things and this is what i want us to address in this session that, that, that also doesn't work that's my two cents on it i think that's 50 cents to be fair but here you go <laughs> touche Thank you. Thank you very, very much, both of you. Uh, we're coming to the end of our, our time today, but as I said, I've noted down lots of questions. Um, so we'll try and, and kind of answer some when we upload the, the webinar recording. Um, I saw a few questions about if the webinar is recorded, um, when will it be available, all those kinds of things. It is being recorded um, and we'll upload it as soon as possible. And what we'll do is everyone who's signed up to today's webinar, we'll send you all a follow up email with the details of the recording so you can rewatch it at any point. Um, I know as well we had um, some kind of more specific questions again about people's individual needs. And so, as I said, please do reach out to us um, and we'd be more than happy to talk at any point. But thank you very, very much to Molly. both of you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ivan and Molly. Because yeah, it's that easy. Final word. Yes, absolutely. Because I've seen a few comments in, in the chat that I just want to address as an overall thing. We've talked about, you know, try this, try that. But one key thing that I may have omitted to really call out, 
you have to act upon what you learn from these things. I talk about reflection, talk about gaining insights, talk about using tools, but I can't stress this enough. And I may be you know, overlooked the most important part here. Use those insights to make a change, right? Just talking about stuff, just reading things, just, just looking at books or going to support groups and listening, that by itself is not gonna do anything for you. You do need to find a way to actually act upon the insights, but that's a different conversation. Thank you. Well, maybe we'll have some more follow-ups because I think we've had such an incredible response. Um, it'll be really good to continue the conversation. So um, we'll have a conversation about that. But as I said, everyone, please do keep coming back to us um, as a charity. We'd be happy to talk. We'd be happy to answer any questions. And we'd be really happy to share our experiences as well. So um, if you're affected by bipolar in any way and would like to keep talking, please do let us know. Um, thank you again to both of you. I always say after we've had sessions like this, make sure you do something nice for yourself afterwards because it can be a little bit overwhelming um, listening to us talk about mental health for an hour. Um, so whatever that nice thing is for you, please do make sure that you do it, that you enjoy it, that you connect with people who care about you. Um, we'll have our next session coming up soon and we'll pop that again in the email um, that you receive. But if we don't see you, kind of soon um we'll hopefully see you at some point we'll also be having a facebook live covering a little bit about this webinar on friday it will be me so you'll see me again um if today wasn't enough <laughs> um and thank you very very much to both of you and for everyone who joined us and goodbye bye bye thanks guys bye -bye. thank you